It's wonderful to see all you here. Um, and thank you everyone for introducing yourselves. Lots of representatives from both in-state and out-of-state, which is great to see. Um, my name is Catherine Chen and I am New York City Audubon's Community Science and Outreach Manager. If this is your first time joining us, welcome. Our winter lecture series takes place every year from November to March. And during this time, we invite five speakers of various backgrounds to give an online talk about their areas of expertise. And this year's theme is Narratives in Nature, in which we showcase speakers who highlight their identity in their work. For those who are not familiar with New York City Audubon and what we do, we are a grassroots and conservation nonprofit that works to protect wild birds and their habitat in New York City. And we work to make the city a safer and more bird-friendly place through engagement and conservation and advocacy. Through engagement, we aim to foster an appreciation for birds and nature and and the people of the city, inspiring them to take conservation action. And in addition to lectures like these, we host hundreds of bird outings, classes, workshops, and festivals every year. Our conservation work involves bird and biodiversity monitoring and various community science projects. Check out our conservation webpage for more information on how you can volunteer with us. If the legislative side of making New York City more bird friendly is more your speed, you should learn more about our advocacy work on our website uh, to learn more about how to take immediate civic action to protect birds in New York City, such as writing to elected officials or volunteering at outreach events, you can become an avian advocate. Um, more information on how to do that will be dropped in a link that's going in the chat right now. As many of you know, uh, we are changing our name, dropping the Audubon to create a more inclusive and welcoming environment for all New Yorkers. Uh, we are so close to deciding our new name, and we will announce it in March, so stay tuned. Um, though our name will change, our work to protect birds and engage New Yorkers will stay exactly as it's always been. Um, and for more information on how the decision and the renaming process is um, about our decision and the renaming process, please visit our website at the link which is being dropped in the chat right now. Um, lastly, a few um, uh, things before we go on to the, the main theme of this tonight's program. Uh, a quick reminder to all that this lecture series will be recorded and later posted on our website for anyone to view. Closed captioning is enabled for the Zoom and in the recording, and we will be sharing the recording with everyone who registered later this week. During tonight's lecture, please type any questions you have in the Q&A, and I will read them aloud to our speaker at the end. You can view this Zoom feature by clicking on the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen. After Ajani's presentation, we will take as many questions as we can. We also want to send a huge thank you to Claude and Lucine Block, uh, whose continued support has made our lecture series possible. And now, without ado, further ado, our speaker tonight is Johnny Stella, the founder and leader of Kids Fight Climate Change, a unique climate education group dedicated to teaching young people about the climate crisis. Ajani is a 17-year-old climate activist living in New York City. He was named one of 30 under 30 worldwide for environmental education by the North American Association for Environmental Education. And his work has been recognized through numerous speaking engagements and accolades. U.S. Secretary of the Interior, Deb Holland invited Ajani to a closed roundtable in July 2023 in recognition of his work. He is a recognized speaker with over 30 speaking engagements worldwide and has been featured on TV programs six times. Ajani has also attended the United Nations Climate Conference, COP26, in November 2021 as an observing NGO delegate with the Human Impacts Institute, representing the Youth Advisory Council he co-founded. As part of his climate work, Johnny has been a climate uh, storytelling intern at Columbia University Teachers College, has participated in and moderated panels about climate education and action, and has spoken about his work to numerous organizations. Uh, Johnny has been engaged with climate action since he spoke to the New York City Teachers Retirement Fund Board of Directors about divesting from fossil fuels when he was 10 years old. Now, please join me in welcoming uh, Johnny Stella uh, and um, yeah, go ahead, Johnny. Hi, everyone, and thank you so much, Catherine, for that amazing introduction. It's really a pleasure to be here tonight. 
Um, as Catherine mentioned, I'm Ajani Stella. I'm the president and founder of Kids Fight Climate Change. And the amazing team at NYC Audubon invited me to speak with you here tonight because of my experience in the climate movement, which is engaging young people to build an intergenerational coalition defending our planet. So for me, tonight is about sharing my vision for the future with all of you and encouraging you to join me as we fight, excuse me, as we fight for that future. Tonight is about changing what activism means. For decades, we have been fighting that fight. We've been valiantly struggling against the forces assembled to counter us, the fossil fuel companies, the special interests, the politicians, the executives, but they have continued to evade us. Our news feeds, social media pages, and media have been overwhelmed with images of burning forests, flooded cities, and dying agriculture. As much as the public has begun to understand that climate change is happening right now, that remains the only narrative. Media still remains hesitant to discuss anything about solutions, to share the stories of climate activists. There are two main types of news stories surrounding activism. The first is failure a blanket headline about how our enemies have once again evaded us, which does bring attention to the movement, but encourages very few to join it. The second is protests, widespread direct action that often receives front page attention, a testament to the movement's ability to stop people in their tracks. But the follow-up from protest is never covered. Climate activism disappears once more from global attention just the day after a major protest because global media no longer cares. It's true in those moments that we have no immediate control. We can't call up the editor-in-chief of the New York Times and demand coverage of our work as much as we might want to. But that lack of control is what inspires our own action. If it were easy, there would be no glory in our victory. So we must rely on our own hope, focusing on the success of our allies over the triumphs of our opponents. We must continue to move forward, not to be distracted by everyone who tells us otherwise, but rather to find solace in our small victories and purpose in our great defeats. It can be hard amongst the images of burning wildfires and devastating hurricanes to imagine that there is any hope. After all, what are we besides a small group of caring people fighting an uphill battle, attempting to beat in seemingly insurmountable odds in our efforts to overpower corporations and their political allies, a never ending quest that rivals the greatest epic tales of history. For climate inaction is so deeply entrenched in our political and economic systems. Incentives exist principally to maintain the status quo, not change it. And thus we are trapped in the same dangerous cycle of production and pollution that threatens our lives. But at the same time as my mind is clouded by these justified fears, I'm reminded of the work of the revolutionary anthropologist Margaret Mead, who once said, Never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that ever has. Meade fought the steepest of uphill battles, attempting to overthrow prevailing notions of sex, sexuality, and race. After each of her works were published, she faced harsh criticism, with opponents attacking not only her research and her beliefs, but also her character. Meade persevered. She marched forward in the face of a powerful blockade, pushing back against the leading voices of her era. Oh, I just saw that text. I think, there we go. Thank you for catching that. Um, but Meade persevered. She marched, uh, I've said that, and she won. She won not just because she had superior resources, but because she was committed, persuasive, and right. Central to Meade's philosophy was that we should rely on those who support us. Her quote here rests on the assumption of collaboration. She takes care not to single out a leader who may carry a movement to victory. And instead, she emphasizes the importance of equality. In fact, she specifically disregards the notion that any other body or system can achieve change in our world besides this small group of caring, thoughtful, committed citizens. Political parties and corporate alliances become fractured and distracted. Individual leaders are disconnected from the people and are powerless in the end. As climate activists fighting in this new arena, we must understand that collaboration, equality are the keys to our success. I tell you Mead's story because in many ways it parallels our own, or rather we have the potential to live up to it. We are stuck in this limbo at a time when most of the country, if not the world, is aware of climate change. 
but we still struggle to bring about major action. Politicians waver, corporations waffle, and activists flounder as we try to find direction in this chaos. To reach Mead's ideals and push for real change, our first step is shedding the despair that surrounds us. If you feel too distraught by the climate crisis to take action, too afraid of what the future holds to do anything about it, know that you are not alone. 45% of people worldwide say that their fear of climate change impairs them from action, according to one recent study. 45%. The first source of this despair is what I've discussed already, a focus on fear over solutions. In all the work that we've done to normalize climate conversations, to bring climate change into global discourse and mainstream media, we've forgotten media's tendency to sensationalize. To bring climate, media by and large favors quick, strong emotions rather than nuanced discussions of fact. So instead of seeing the areas where we can make progress, we are paralyzed by the notion that our daunting task is impossible. Take for instance, media's usage of the terms climate catastrophe and climate crisis. Those are terms that I'm using today. They've staggeringly increased over the last few years. In some ways, in many ways, that's great. It's a marker of our success because it conveys the urgency of the task that we're facing. It's what we've been wanting media to do. It's what we've been advocating for as activists. But here's the problem. When media publishes these terms on their own, living only in the negative of climate doomism, the rhetoric disincentivizes solutions and disincentivizes hope. If we only think about climate change as an immutable catastrophe, a never ending crisis, then there's no reason that we should think of it as something that we can solve, something to change. That's paired alongside the loss of local journalism. And that's something that you'll read about in the news all the time. That's a, a problem that permeates through all aspects of our political and social lives. But one of those, one of the results is the declining focus on local climate solutions. Local journalism is so impactful because it highlights what's happening in our communities. Communities and small organizations are on the front lines of the climate movement, pioneering innovative solutions to the world's greatest challenges, but they don't receive the national media attention that they deserve because of their scale and funding. Taken together, we're creeping towards a nihilistic apathy toward the climate crisis. If everything is going wrong with the world, then what really is our purpose? That's of course a dangerous proposition, but it's also an untrue one. It's fallacy to suggest that anything we do now is somehow going to do nothing, no matter what mainstream sources say. I said before that we're stuck in a limbo where the entire world can see with their own eyes the effects of climate change in every country, yet we still lag in action. While the first sense of despair, of this despair is certainly media sensationalism, apathy and disconnect also stem from a separate source the changing battleground on which we now fight. If you look closely, you'll see that the opponents of climate action have shifted their rhetoric. No longer are they talking ab about climate change being false. Even Fox News and its allies have given up that message. Rather, now they claim that because climate solutions are costly, they're dangerous, they're harmful. They discourage climate solutions that are against their own interests by planting a suspicion within their viewership that scientists and activists have yet to develop anything that may solve climate change. So at the same time as mainstream media overshadows hope with doomism, our more traditional and historical opponents are viciously attacking solutions. This forms a new fight for us, certainly, and on two fronts. But to me, it also shows our success. We moved our opponent's baseline to opposing action rather than opposing the idea of climate change itself. We won that first battle and advanced our marching troops forward. People are hearing us and they're listening. Central to this success has been the voice of activists. We are the small group of thoughtful, committed citizens that we're not so small anymore. Activists' efforts to bring climate change to national attention has given us incredible opportunity for progress. As fossil fuel companies dig in and fortify themselves, we have the power to push forward. But only if we recognize that to maintain our momentum, we must focus on action. Fear-mongering and endless despair gets us nowhere. Certainly, we can allow ourselves a few moments to let the staggering weight of our task engulf us, but then we must get up, 
dust ourselves off and show the world that we are not afraid to lead by example. If all the activists, organizers, and leaders across the world were to suddenly stop beating down the doors of governments and big corporations, I can guarantee you there would be no change in our world. Instead, we would rush forward to the worst future the scientists could predict for us, destroying our planet, but also destroying our own society in the process. Climate activism is the way out. Climate activists are the ones shining the light at the dark end of the tunnel that we're in. The reason for this is simple. Activists give voice to the uncollected, disparate thoughts of the greater public. It's a natural human tendency to assume that we're alone if we never hear anyone else voice our own thoughts. We conclude that our beliefs are wrong just because the general populace does not share them. And the same issue occurs with climate change, because without a broad base of support, we presume no others believe in action. That is the beauty of activists. By being unabashedly loud, we show everyone around us that we are not alone. In doing so, we encourage more people to take action unlocking that spark buried deep within. That's when the trend of activism since its modern era began in the 1960s, spurred by the production of Rachel Carson's Silent Spring. As a conservationist and journalist, she documented the environmental harm done by pesticides during World War II and the subsequent disinformation campaign by the chemical industry. Because of her research and writing, individuals and organizations were awoken to what was truly being done to our environment. So the nascent environmental movement took to the streets, to schools, to legislative houses to demand action. They provided a framework for fighting climate change in just a few years. They passed a landmark legislation that we, today we take for granted, the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, the Environmental Protection Act, uh, the Environmental Protection Agency, the Environmental Magna Carta, the Endangered Species Act, all of these were the result of the early environmental movement. And it culminated in the world's first Earth Day on April 22nd, 1970. For the first time, the more traditional conservationist organizations, which have been around for almost a century, joined with young activists in, re reinvigorated by Rachel Carson to champion efforts against modern environmental issues. The Indian historian and environmentalist Ramachandra Guha aptly writes that the environmental movement born in the aftermath of the turbulent 1960s was the child of the many different social movements combined. The anti-war movement, the civil rights movement, the feminist movement. Early environmentalists saw the success of large scale marches for both racial rights and anti-war activists. They saw the powerful images of burning draft cards in public sit-in as signs that they should do the same. So the anti-war movement's teaching strategy became the basis for Earth Day, and na large national groups formed to facilitate small, localized action that modeled after the civil rights movement. These are the stories that should be talked about. Much of their early success came from, the sh from their shared anger over environmental issues. Environmentalism became, surprisingly, the social movement that unified rather than divided. However, as we know now today, over time, Partisan politics seeped into climate change. And as so many Americans became poisoned with climate denialism and antipathy toward a green economy, advances stagnated. Still, we're trying the same thing, shouting loudly, genuinely, and passionately on the streets, demanding political groups listen to us, begging for funding and time, but we're struggling. In the 2000s and 2010s, climate issues fell by the wayside as economic and diplomatic issues took center stage in political discussions. Even pr as President Obama invested in clean energy and led the country to the Paris Climate Agreement, national apathy was apparent. I would not dare call the environmental movement of the 1970s easy. It was far from that facing myriad issues of its own. But I do believe that we face an even, an even greater struggle today. The reason? The country has changed. The world has changed. No longer do we have to force people to know about climate change, at which protests were extremely effective. Now we have to inspire them to join us, empower them to make a difference. It's a harder task and it requires more nuance. It requires leading by example and leading with action. No longer can we just shout about climate change. We must show people what we are doing and can do to solve the climate crisis. We're entering what I like to call the new era of climate activism, where our movement is broadening. 
To be effective, we require a fresh spark that can reinvigorate our efforts. We found that in young people. Youth are the solution to the environmental movement's many woes, principally, principally because they bring new blood, new energy, new passion, and new leadership. I know I'm biased because I wouldn't be here if it weren't for the youth movement. I'm 17 years old after all. But if you look at the trend of recent history, and I'll get to that in a minute, the youth movement completely transformed how our country and the world thinks about climate change. On the one hand, it gave media something new to cover. The environmental movement was getting old for the New York Times to keep putting on its front page. It didn't want to keep showing the same people, the same organizations, the same groups. When youth groups suddenly came into play, when youth activists suddenly started striking from school, it gave them a new headline, something that was fully devoted to action. And so they ran with that and they focused on that for a long time until that also got old and now we're facing the battle again. At the same time as the more mainstream neutral media and newspapers and journalists had something new to focus on, it was a lot harder for opposition media, for the, for the corporate strategists, for the conservative think tanks to attack the character of activists. For a long time, that's been the strategy to accuse uh, liberal and, and environmental activists as somehow destructive or dangerous or immoral. You can't do that to young people. You put a picture of a 10 year old on the news, there's no outlet in the country that's gonna claim that this kid is evil. So suddenly we had this new in to, um, to talking about climate change where we wouldn't be accused of lying or, or being wrong. At the, at the same time as we're thinking about our image in the rest of the country, the idea of our future became much more tangible and much more urgent. Suddenly we had children marching in the streets where their future was being spelled out before them and adults that never really thought about the future longer than 20 years ahead suddenly realized the long-term impacts of their actions. They could see in their kids, in their grandkids, in their nieces and nephews, in their students, that climate change was something that was about, that was truly happening to real people. It wasn't just something that future generations were gonna have to deal with, it was something that's happening now. Put together, this is showing us that, is showing the public really, that there's more to environmentalism. It's not just the 1960s and 70s hippie generation, as amazing as they were, all of to them, but it's exciting, it's bold, it's energetic, and it's cool to be an activist now. Kids are noisy, we're obnoxious, and we're persistent. So parents and teachers have to listen to us. It's a lot easier to ignore your sibling, your spouse, your parents, whatever adult peer you have than it is to, annoy your, to ignore your kid who will continue to annoy you and will never go away. It's often assumed that young people can only relate to their peers. And while it's true that we have extraordinary power among our fellow youth, I'll get to that later, it's also true that we have an inordinate influence on society as a whole. And so this is the data that I was referencing a bit ago. Take a look, if you can um, take a look at your screen and look at the blue and gray lines around 2016 to 2019. So that those lines represent um, more liberal Americans and just Americans as a whole. 2016 to 2019 is when the youth movement was starting for real. And that's when we had Greta Thunberg doing her first um, strikes. We have youth organizations forming around the world. And we have media, like I was saying, covering that in a whole new way than they used to cover environmental activism. And 2016, 2019, what we're seeing is a massive uptick in how Americans view climate change. Yes, we saw an increase throughout the 2010s and that was the result of political debates putting it in center stage, but we haven't seen this kind of unprecedented sudden increase that the then in any other place than the youth movement. And what that's showing us is the impact of young people for all the reasons I just outlined. So why do we care about that? Because it's a new strategy that gets attention. And young people do bring something unique to the table, our hope and our innovation. Young people are 
special because <laughs> as self aggrandizing as that sounds, because we're able to look at society's problems and be untainted. With every year that someone lives on this planet, every day really, they're introduced with new ideas, new worries, and new philosophies that weigh on them. The ideological young person is turned into the bashful adult, afraid to make any dangerous statement. Young people have no such boundaries, no such fears. They create thought for themselves. They speak about the world as they understand it. For every 60-year-old that we have who staunchly defends the status quo without any evidential backing, we have a six-year-old who genuinely asks the boldest question anyone can. Why? And that casual interrogative becomes a burning curiosity for that child as they seek to understand, to analyze, and to conclude. Young people are malleable, yes, but they are also strong and remain our only hope to change society. For the past seven years, I've worked to develop that skill in myself and my peers as soon as I learned about it in my own education. My activism began in fifth grade when I was 10 years old. I first learned about climate change in my fifth grade science class taught by my science teacher, Vicki Sando. She taught us all about the greenhouse effect, about renewable energy, we built model wind turbines and tested them on a green roof that we were lucky to have. And while this was an important part of our curriculum and I'm so glad that everyone in the class had that, I took a special interest in climate change. So Vicky started to teach me more on the side. We did extra projects. We, she gave me more books and more reading material. I studied more, I learned more because I saw that climate change was something that would impact all of us. Vicky showed me that it wasn't something that we need just be scared of, but also something that we can have an impact on. So it was through here that I found my first speaking opportunity. That was the New York City Teachers Pension Fund Board of Directors when I was 10 years old. This is, this is the group that manages all of the pension funds, all of the retirement money for New York City's public school teachers. And we were urging them to divest from fossil fuels. So I studied. And I prepared, I rewrote the draft of my speech with the help of my parents again and again and again, until finally it was a day in January 2017, so over seven years ago now, where I stood at the top of a tower in the financial district in a stuffy boardroom, looking down a table, people full, or people dressed in suits with stony expressions, and I stood atop a box and told them why they were stealing my future. I didn't really realize the impact of what I was doing then. I didn't know that it would lead to a whole career of me speaking, the beginning of a new activist. But that was true. When I told them about how I've had a, the privilege of living in a wonderful environment, the amazing experience of traveling to places across the world that would be destroyed because of climate change, I emphasized my lived experience, my own lived experience. I didn't just talk about facts. I didn't just tell them about the the, the numbers about how they were destroying the world, but rather I told them the story of myself. That's been the purpose of my activism and my climate career for the past seven years. And that's been the focus that I've tried to bring into myself and bring into my activism. My early foray into environmental activism continued to be defined by my emphasis on storytelling before I even began to study climate change, my nonprofit, and my public speaking, as I understand it today. I developed two main arms to my activism. On the one hand, I had my local political uh, campaigns through 350 NYC. And you can see that's the top image there. I'm delivering a, a speech to Comptroller Scott Stringer, um, continuing the same campaign and divestment. At the same time as I started that, or I continued that really, I was learning about creative art and expression through the Human Impacts Institute. The Human Impacts Institute is an amazing climate arts nonprofit that I worked with for years. And they showed me the importance of not just talking about the, the cold, hard sciences of politics, of climate change and climate science, but also the humanity behind climate change, behind climate action. I learned the importance of bridging these two aspects together. We haven't as a, as a society, as a movement focused on this aspect. We have we've ignored the people of the climate crisis. 
So HAI showed me how to slow down in the rush of the global, global movement. In the image at the bottom, I interviewed climate leaders from different industries. And the overall trend that I learned from that day, six years ago now, was that climate change and climate action is not one thing. There are so many different aspects of the movement that we can't all try to encompass, that we can't all try to fix or to work on. So I chose my lane. I chose my focus to be education and storytelling. And though I gravitated toward those aspects. As I grew as an activist, entering larger conversations and spaces, my work with the Human Impacts Institute took me to COP26, the United Nations Climate Conference in 2021, as Catherine mentioned at the beginning. It was hosted in Glasgow, Scotland. It was my first foray into the global political debate surrounding climate change. I spoke with policymakers, nonprofit leaders, and activists from around the world, all of whom gave me hope for a better future. But at the same time, I faced a myriad of disappointments, ranging from the Eurocentric displays of power and the oppression to the lack of youth and indigenous representation and the rampant tokenization of these voices. A member of the Scottish de delegation with whom I spoke hoped that COP26 would be an opportunity to show nations often to showcase nations often sidelined in international negotiations and to emphasize how they're, as she put it, actively working together to make a big difference. Working together to make a big difference. That November, Scotland showed me that they understood what collective action really meant. They weren't seeking glory or wealth, but merely, merely collaboration to create a better future. The delegate that I spoke with emphasized that Scotland was a devolved nation, meaning that decision-making is centered closer to the people. This is crucial, because it shows us that when countries listen to the cries of their constituents, to the cries of their people, we can make a difference. But the work of these smaller nations is not shown to the world. They don't have a chance to share their story. The narrative is instead dominated by global superpowers intent on lessening their role in the solution strategy. When I spoke with the delegation from Cote d'Ivoire, a small nation on the West African coast, we focused on the idea of responsibility. We agreed that they bear very little responsibility for climate change. After all, they have been the victim of vicious colonialism that has forced them into predatory global trade patterns and sustainable industrialization, while saddling them with the climate crisis that wealthy nations caused. At the same time, we solemnly concluded that responsibility isn't working out this way. It has become the responsibility of Cote d'Ivoire to clean up our mess. Importantly, these delegates share their story with me, not with the main plenary at COP26, not with the wealthy nations who hold all the cards at the conference. While we were speaking at the side offices, the principal speakers were touting the West's so-called accomplishments, a blatant attempt at greenwashing that disrespected the hardships and efforts of developing nations around the world. Since our society tends to only listen to those loud speakers, I made it my mission to highlight the work and struggles of the people, groups, and nations that are never highlighted. Many people think about climate change as a top-down issue, both within their own countries and internationally. But if we refocus that narrative to show the world what is starting from the bottom, the small countries, the people, the activists, then we can show the people at the top how to get it done. This bottom-up approach has been the key operating principle of my nonprofit, Kids Fight Climate Change, in so many ways. I founded Kids Fight Climate Change that year, um, the same year as at COP26, as a consolidation of my resources as an activist. I thought it was a great way to engage more people, more young people, like I have been taught as a fifth grader. I was lucky to have that kind of climate education, but so many people, my peers going into middle school and high school, never had those opportunities. So Kids Fight Climate Change was my way to ensure that everyone, every young person in America and eventually the world can have education. The first way, the first main way that we are a bottom-up organization is that we are entirely youth-led. We are giving young people opportunities 
to participate in the climate movement and preserve the unique hope and innovation that I talked about before. By granting young people leadership opportunities, we are focusing on our motto of made by youth, built for youth, because we believe that young people understand young people. By emphasizing peer-led education, we're pioneering a new type of activism that emphasizes not just how we can engage youth in the climate crisis, but how we can foster their action and encourage them to think about more than just their lesson, but how they really can be youth activists. But we're only doing that because of the power of young people right now. So that's the first way that we're bottom up. At the same time, we recognize, or, or I recognize, that I do not know how to run a nonprofit. I, I started this when I'm 15, I'm 17 now. There are trained experts that have 30 years in the industry who struggle to run their own organization. So I have no delusions of grandeur when it comes to developing corporate strategy or planning out um, my nonprofit's mission. That's where our adult advisory board comes in. So many youth groups fail because they refuse to accept th that we need help and that's okay. It's good. It's powerful to ask for help. So my nonprofit board, the Kids Fight Climate Change Board, is made up of experienced adult professionals, nonprofit leaders, product strategists, environmental educators, who are able to advise us while still maintaining the 100% youth leadership of the organization. In doing so, we create the second bottom-up strategy, building youth activists that advocate for systemic change. We're moving away from the models of activism where young people and other students have to wait for instruction from the experienced adults, but rather take advantage of that themselves. I'm often asked why youth leadership is a requisite for youth activism. Why do I not focus on teachers or parents who have all the power to influence young people? For that answer, I turn to Emerson, who informed us, do not think the youth has no force because he cannot speak to you and me. Park. In the next room, his voice is sufficiently clear and emphatic. It seems he knows how to speak to his contemporaries. Simply put, young people relate to young people. Youth everywhere have a unique capacity to articulate and persuade. We may not be learned in every skill of business or art, nor be able to develop new theories of physic physics and calculus, but we are unrivaled in our camaraderie and passion. We are not the future leaders of this world, we are the current ones. This is my answer to the demand of a new era for the environmental movement, a power of young people that I call the new environmentalism. To tap into that power, education is the key. But that education must be empowered. At Kids by Climate Change, we focus on this new era by emphasizing action over despair, hope over fear. Just as Ramachandra Guha showed the early environmentalists responded to and learned from their social and political context, we have to understand that our constantly changing time where kids are flooded with messages about climate change makes our work as activists and educators remedial, reframing young people's understanding of climate change to include the possibility of action and change. So the first way that we do that is through our seminar programs where we engage young people in climate action in classrooms. I emphasize my story as an activist, where I showed young people, where I show young people that climate action really is possible from their age. We focus on action, where we develop, where I, I once we've established what climate change is, what climate action means, I work with them to make sure that they develop an action plan that they can implement in their communities and in their schools. Now we're working starting as young as seventh grade, as young as seven year olds, excuse me, all the way up to 12th grade. In every seminar that we've conducted and we've reached over 2,500 kids, they have developed 10 point action plans that encompass their entire school community. This is the impact of youth led climate education. I've talked to these teachers afterwards, they've tried to engage young people in climate conversations before. It hasn't worked because they are not related to in the same way that we are when we go into classrooms. The second part of our program is our online learning portal. And this is where we have youth writers creating content that is accessible, engaging, 
and impactful for young people to learn about at their own in their own time. We, we seek to engage students asynchronously. We have a double benefit of using youth volunteers. So we're getting the, both those bottom up strategies that I talked about with our online learning portal. Put together, these programs form the backbone of the new environmentalism that Kids Fight Climate Change is pioneering. We put our focus on young people as the leaders of agents and uh, leaders and agents of change, not passive tools or subjects. As young people, we are not climate activists because we want to be. We are climate activists because we need to be. It's true that it's not our responsibility and others should be fixing it. But governments, corporations, and climate deniers are acting against our future, so we have to get it back. In particular, this brand of activism has allowed a focus on local communities, proving that climate action is tangible and accessible, and providing youth a clear path to enter the movement. As we form these action communities, we are able to link them together to create national and global change. Kids Fight Climate Change has never been alone in our quest, even as we pioneer the youth peer engagement model. We have allies across the movement that demonstrate the new environmentalism, and NYC Audubon is a powerful example. It'd be easy for them to be a niche organization reserved for scientists, birders, and enthusiasts. But instead, it engages directly with the city as a whole and focuses on particular areas to foster understanding of our natural habitat around us, even in our famous concrete jungle. By envisioning a future where humans and nature live in harmony, taking tangible local steps toward it, NYC Audubon empowers their members and followers to believe in that same vision. Its education and awareness campaigns put the focus on the local communities and show New Yorkers how they relate to their local environments. The Habitat Protection and Project Safe Flight are two prime examples of a community-based initiative that has implications for the entire ecosystem. This is a perfect paradigm for what I'm talking about with the new environmentalism, for focusing on not just what is being done, and what has been done, but what we can do to make a positive difference. So in that way, NYC Audubon is creating action communities in the same way as Kids Fight Climate Change is. Even though the success of NYC Audubon and similar organizations, as well as Kids Fight Climate Change, sustains my hope, we are still struggling to face our fear as a movement. Youth across the world, even those most involved in the climate movement, feel disheartened. Certainly they're right that climate action is not moving nearly as fast as it needs to. Global fossil fuel consumption decreased only two percentage points over the past two years, and global fossil fuel subsidies reached $7 trillion in 2022. But we also saw unprecedented levels of renewable energy investment. In New York, climate change was one of the top voting concerns in the 2022 midterm election. My intention is not to minimize what we have to accomplish, but rather remind us what we have accomplished. But the climate movement is often self-effacing. We focus on our defeats rather than our triumphs, sometimes as much as the media I discussed at the beginning does. Young people are especially guilty as their unrealistic expectation of immediate systemic change makes them balk at the idea of failure or setback. In developing the new environmentalism, we have forgotten what every movement before us has forced to learn, has been forced to learn. It's okay to fail. We must fail. We fail because our task is hard, nearly impossible, and certainly improbable, but we fight for it anyways. To me, that is true bravery. To continue not just because we expect success, but because we prepare for failure. So let us fail so spectacularly that the entire world knows and they join us in our struggle. Let us fail so spectacularly that none can ever forget or ignore the climate movement. And then one day our failures will turn into victories. We are on the verge of something new, a change to a system that everyone recognizes is broken, but no one yet knows how to solve. Our society has undergone this change before as we redefined our understandings of democracy and freedom. As we work to redefine ourselves once more, it will include for the first time our natural world and our right to a safe future as a part of our freedom. We will fail many times before we reach this vision, but once we do, it will, it will be worth every moment of pain. For any of this to work, we need education. 
I keep returning to this key principle, and perhaps this is my own bias as the leader of a climate education organization. But I truly believe at the end of the day, education, when done properly, inspires action. Never has there been a more successful social movement in history that has relied on a population unaware of and uneducated on their importance and mission. The climate movement is no exception. In the early 1900s, Liberty Hyde Bailey, one of the foremost environmental philosophers and writers of this era said, the power that moves the world is the power of the teacher. Bailey was referring to public school teachers, giving voice to one of the most true statements in American society, the influence of our educators. In our time, however, education is not limited to the formality of the classroom. The notion of who can be considered a teacher is changing. In the loose sense of the word, I am one through my work as kids fight climate change, and so are you as activists. That's the true form of climate action. We are teachers for each other, for the public, and most importantly, for ourselves. We all have the power to unlock within the world and ourselves to drive to create change. It's doubtful that this speech will ever an enter the annals of history by any metric, but the actions that we take from this day forward may well have an impact that will be felt for generations. We stand together on a precipice. One step in the wrong direction and our entire society falls into the abyss, but one step in the right direction and we are well on the path to victory. I implore you to remember that what you do with your life, the choices you make truly do have an impact. Every person who has changed the world has been just that person, no different from you or me. It's been a long road for me from the stuffy boardroom in the financial district to speaking with you here today. I enter a new chapter in my life, one defined by struggle and resolve, but also camaraderie and ambition. Are we up to this challenge? Are we up to face our evil enemies as they plot our destruction? Are we up to the sacrifices that we must make as we move forward in this movement? Our decision, our answer to these questions as a collective people will re reverberate throughout history. Now is the time for the promises of our nation to be fulfilled. Now is the time for us to bring down the filthy towers of fossil fuel companies. Now is the time to rise as a movement once more from the disconnected, flooded, burned, dried out corners of our world and demand a just future. Together, we will meet the task before us and we will prevail. Thank you. I think that makes it time for Q&A, right? Yes, sorry. Um, no worries. My camera was taking a little bit time to load. That was so amazing. Thank you so much for that wonderful presentation, Johnny. Um, we do Thank have you. some amazing questions. Um, first, do you change your storytelling approach depending on the audience you're speaking to? For example, left-leaning versus right-leaning communities. And similarly, what do you say to climate deniers? How do you convert them? I'm so glad you brought that up because that was actually something I wrote and cut from this speech because of time. So thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk about that anyways. Um, storytelling is exactly that. It's all about your audience because it does. if I'm telling the wrong story to the wrong people, then it's gonna have no impact. So when I'm talking to a uh, more conservative um, audience, what I often emphasize is how I learned about the economic impacts of climate change. So I will maybe talk about the story of a farmer in the Midwest who has um, lost his crops due to climate change, who is not able to sustain his family, to support his income. I tend to stay away from the more social impacts of climate change. I, I don't talk nearly as much about environmental justice. As much as we'd love for the entire world to care about that as much as we do, we need to focus on how we can get people to support climate policy right now. In terms of climate deniers, because you brought that up as well, I, I struggle, I go back and forth with whether we really need to engage with them as much now. Because like I mentioned before, the new, the new battleground for us is convincing people that we have the capacity to create change. The majority of the world population actually does believe in climate change now, and at least the voting populace does. And the people who don't at this point even when Fox News is admitting that climate change is true, when you have right-leaning news sources like that doing that, um, we're not going to get 
as much response as we used to. So the like so like I was saying that our our focus has shifted to to convincing the more moderate climate um climate believers or the the disconnected hopeless people that they can have an impact. Um, you spoke about your organization's adult board. How do you decide whether or not to implement their advice? Honestly, that that's a that's a great question. I I love their advice usually, so that's um it, typically a no brainer. I really appreciate their guidance, um, and they've been an amazing asset for me. I I will never unilaterally decide to ignore their advice. I like I said before, I don't believe in the concept of one person deciding something. Um, I'm still the president of the organization, so I do have to make the final call on a lot of things, but I really want to make this a democratic process as much as possible. So after a board meeting, I'll schedule a meeting with my youth leadership team, which we call the leadership council. And then we'll go through all their advice. We'll talk about um, what we liked, what we didn't think about, the new things that we discovered, um, their reactions, and of course, what we disagreed with. And so there are certainly times where we don't take their advice. And they're completely okay with that because they know their role is advisory. But I only do that when we can combine the minds of our, our young leaders together. Um, your organization is taking on a lot on something that can be overpowering and depressing. As a climate crisis expert, what gives you hope that we might get it right after all? And also related to that, are we too late? Can we get it right on time? We are definitely not too late. I'm gonna answer the second part first. We are definitely not too late. There is going to be no point in history where we're too late to stop some aspect of the climate crisis. Because maybe the sound is depressing, but it can always get worse. But that means it can always get better. And we're still at the point right now, like I was saying before, that media believes we do not have a way out, but activists still do. And that's the power of young people. We're able to see the world um, as we want it to, to, to see a more hopeful future. And can you remind me the first part of the question, actually? Sorry. Yeah. Um, as a climate crisis expert, what gives you hope oh, that we might right. get it yes. right after all? Giving me hope is actually seeing all of my friends, my uh, my peers in the climate movement. I often joke that I have my two social media feeds, one's my Instagram, that's the doom and gloom, and one's my LinkedIn, where I'm connected to all these amazing activists, and I get to see the incredible work that they're doing that's not being highlighted by the New York Times. Um, and so there I see that we are actually not alone in this fight, and we're powerful, we're impactful, and that really just sustains my hope. Definitely. It's always amazing whenever you are with other people who also have hope. Definitely. Um, what are your thoughts about our ability to produce renewable energy in sufficient quantities today? There was a report from the IPCC, um, the, that's the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, it's the United Nations body, um, the scientific body for climate research. And I think it was two years ago now um, where they said that we have all the technology and all the science that we need to stop climate change. And this was in their summary for policymakers. It was sent out to every government in the world and we have all the tech, we've done all the development, we've done all the innovation that we need. What we need to do now is implement all of it. So in terms of developing the capacity for, new, for renewable energy, we know exactly how we can do that. We know exactly the investments we need, where to put it, how to do it, we can do it. The question is just getting the politicians and the people on board. And we have seen a movement toward that in recent years. And like I was saying earlier, a lot of that is the economic benefits. Solar panels, wind turbines, they're now both an implementation comparable to um, to coal plants and to oil, and they're long-term far, far cheaper. So we're using that argument to get more renewable energy programs in. And I do believe that we are able to move the needle there to get there faster. But to your point, it's not happening nearly fast enough. So that is the main battleground that we're facing now. Um, I think we have time for one more question, if that's all right. Um, of course. You're clearly not a average 17 year old. What motivates you to do this instead of playing video games or TikToking like so many of your peers? Thank you. And uh, I, I will, I, I'll answer that. And I really appreciate that. And I do agree that um, it's not normal for a young person to be so involved in the movement. 
But I will push back on the idea that this generation is supposedly the um the TikTok generation or the latest generation. And I'm not saying that was your assumption. That that's what you were saying in your question. Whoever asked that, but that's often what's portrayed. This generation is one of the most politically active that we've ever seen. And I have seen and I have felt nothing but support from my peers and from my friends and my classmates um, in in my work. That being said, my friends and classmates are also not running a climate nonprofit. And that's completely OK. It, it, it's not something that should be asked of a high schooler. But for me, I think it was um, honestly, and it sounds weird, but a natural evolution from where I started. I, I, I just met a lot of people. I, I, I met a lot of climate leaders from a young age. I, I learned about the movement and I think I was introduced probably 10 years earlier than a lot of other people. And I saw something that was missing. Um, I, I, I really wanted to be a voice. I wanted to be a leader. And I saw that those opportunities didn't exist nearly as much as they should. And I wanted to help provide that solution. I wanted to help engage my friends. I wanted to engage my classmates that weren't getting the education that I was so lucky to receive. And so those two aspects really combined. And that's what I think um, kept me going. Or uh, sorry, that's what started me up. And the incredible response that I've received, the, the support from adults and the success among young people has kept me going since then. Awesome. Well, I think that's all the time we have today for questions, but thank you so much for speaking up with us and sharing your story. Um, I'm sure I speak for everyone here, adults and kids alike, that watching you and your work is truly inspiring. Um, to everyone watching, we are currently in our winter season of programs, so please be sure to check out our winter bird outings um, that we have planned on our calendar. The link will be dropped in the chat. Uh, if you like this lecture, don't forget to join us next month for our uh, fifth and last lecture of the series, The Backyard Bird Chronicles, a fireside chat with Amy, uh, with Amy Tan on March 5th. Uh, a link to that uh, registration page will also be dropped in the chat. And with that, thank you again, Ajani, for speaking with us and all of you for joining tonight. Have a great night and see you next time. Thank you all so much.